Okay, so now I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Anthony Tamsin works at the intersection of urbanization and digital technology. He is urbanist in residence at Cornell Tex Jacobs Institute, where his, his research focuses on scenarios and ethical frameworks for urban tech innovation. Dr. Townsend is the author of two books, Ghost Road Beyond the Driverless Car, um, published in 2020, and uh, Smart Cities, Big Data, Civic Hackers, and The Quest for New Utopia, published in 2013. And I'd like to mention that this book, the second book, Smart Cities, has been cited almost 2,000 times. And it was uh, the first book I read about smart cities that got me interested also on equity side of smart cities. So I'm very glad that Dr. Townsend decided to join us today. His, he has a consultancy, it's called Star City Group and works around the world with industry, government and philanthropy on urban tech foresight, policy and planning studies. Please help me doc um, welcome Dr. Townsend. So you're in charge now, Dr. Townsend and I'll be back at the end to facilitate the discussion. Great, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Excellent. Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome um, to um, this talk about uh, what I call the ghost road. Um, I'm going to slide over here to um, my presentation and um, what I think of is this beautiful cover of the book that was published last June. Um, you know, they say that if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, did it really fall? Well, if a book is published right after a pandemic hits, you know, was it really published? And I like to pretend no, because, um, you know, it was a terrible time to publish a book. Um, the world's attention was elsewhere. It was not on the future, not on the future of technology, for sure. Um, so I'm excited to um, have a second go around in 2021. And uh, I think people are um, starting to uh, open their minds to thinking about the future and, and a little bit of optimism. Um, so it's an exciting time. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what has happened uh, during the pandemic to uh, the, the technology timeline and our expectations about automated vehicles, which were really kind of on a very, very rapid um, pace of development before that and then got kind of derailed but also took a turn um, that was a little bit unexpected. The cover um, was actually, um, it's, it's one of the things I loved the most about the book, although I didn't do it, was done by an artist in Washington state named Mary Iverson. Uh, and the reason I love it is because it's, it's, it, it's sort of this primordial scene of um, you know, this, this marshy landscape with the, uh, the traces, almost kind of like minority report. Um, you know, which I noticed was on your, your uh, I think it was on your uh, list of films about the future. Um, you know, and then this, uh, this pixelated kind of monolith in the center, um, you know, what is that? Um, you know, that's the future. That's the computerized, digital, uh, algorithmically organized future intruding upon this beautiful, pristine natural landscape. And in so many ways, you know, that is what we're dealing with when we deal with automated mobility. We're dealing with a, a force uh, for organizing the physical world that really knows no limits. Um, and uh, it can do wonderful things for us or it can, it can really kind of double down on the waste that we have seen in the 20, 20th century uh, with kind of um, you know, very energy intensive, very wasteful, and consumptive forms of, of transportation. And so that's what I was trying to capture with, with this book um, and the stories that I tell and the images that I'm trying to evoke. Um, just tremendous potential and tremendous risk as well as we go forward with this technology. I think it's important to understand just what an old uh, dream this is. If you look in any mythic tradition, you will find a hero, a king, a heroine, somebody who is zooming around the world, sometimes in the air, sometimes on the ground, in a, a conveyance that uh, both is self-propelled self and self-guided. Um, it could be a throne, it could be a magic carpet. Um, here, apparently, it's a throne on a magic carpet. Um, sometimes it's a chariot. 
uh, in uh, Norse myths, uh, the god Frey has a little folding ship, a self-steering ship that um, he folds up and sticks in his pocket. Um, but it's, it's common, it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, it's one of our oldest technological dreams and we're basically finally achieving it. Um, it also sprang up really in the beginning of um, the motor age, uh, going back to the 1920s, almost as soon as we start, start spending a lot of time in motor vehicles, trying to drive long distances, um, the thrill of driving disappears and we realize how boring and dangerous it is. And we start trying to uh, invent ways to automate it. This is uh, a screenshot. I've taken the videos out of this presentation because they didn't translate to Zoom very well. Um, but this is a, a 1956 GM uh, kind of scenario of the future video um, that portrays like a journey in a self-driving car. Um, the technology called autopilot, which you may be aware has reemerged uh, in Tesla's vehicles these days. The history of self-driving technology um, has been told many times. Uh, you know, it's uh, both fascinating and incredibly dull at the same time, depending on, on your interests. Um, but I think that the, the important takeaway from it is that um, it happened really slowly and it mostly depended upon um, the size and power of portable computers like so many other things in our lives. Um, you know, it, it, the first couple of threshold moments happened when uh, we could finally put computers into trucks and vans that were small and powerful enough to be able to do things like decode uh, uh, image streaming from a video camera and identify the lines on a highway. And so Mercedes, um, the Japanese automakers also did experiments with this in the 80s. Uh, and then uh, in the 2000s was when things really started to pick up pace. There were a number of competitions sponsored by the U.S. Defense Department uh, that brought together robotics research groups from all over the country. I don't know if Virginia Tech competed in that. I would guess that they probably did. Um, and what emerged out of those competitions uh, was uh, Larry Page and Google becoming incredibly interested in the commercial potential of these technologies that um, most others at the time thought were, were merely for military use. And Google scooped up a bunch of the people from these teams, stuck them in a building and put them to work building what you see here, which was uh, a little self-driving buggy um, that they imagined would become uh, a form of uh, independent mobility for people who were left behind by conventional automobiles visually impaired people, the elderly, um, and, and others. Um, and they have invested billions, tens of billions of dollars in this technology and really kickstarted the whole industry and forced the traditional automo automobile industry into this future well ahead of schedule. Um, you know, just in one year, in 2018, uh, about $125 billion globally on automated mobility which you know, is anywhere from five to six times what the aerospace and defense industry spent on R&D that year. Um, just to give you a sense of the, the tremendous sums of money involved in uh, you know, making this a reality. This is uh, one of the images that has kind of lost uh, in the transition to, from video to still, but what it shows is a um, a self-driving Uber back when Uber was still testing its self-driving vehicles, blowing through a red light in San Francisco during testing late in 2016. And, you know, the point here is that um, this technology has been um, wildly successful um, in terms of just how fast uh, it has moved forward um, in the last few years because of, of really, um, sort of exponential increases in the uh, speed and quality of um, uh, machine learning technology. Um, but, you know, it's an incredibly challenging task and these machines are trying to operate in incredibly complex environments and our expectations are very high. And when they fail, they tend to fail catastrophically. 
what's happened during the pandemic um, to, to the trend is a variety of things, but um, for sure the amount of money going into the technology has slowed. Um, this was already um, against the backdrop of sort of um, a declining return on investment. Like most of the low hanging fruit um, had, been, had been harvested already. And the groups that were working on self-driving vehicles were really starting to come up against very, very stubborn problems. And the techniques with the, they had been using like deep learning to make really rapid advances we're not yielding as much progress. So what we've seen is also a winnowing, a lot of consolidation, um, and things have sort of started to settle down and slow down a little bit. I think what's more interesting though, um, is just how um, our understanding of what self-driving technology is for has changed. Um, and you know, a lot of what I do in the book is really try to examine like a very basic question, which is why um, why do we think self-driving technology is, is about cars? Um, when everything that has been happening that's interesting in mobility uh, is about moving away from cars. And that I really just noticed there's this huge disconnect between the way that um, people in Silicon Valley and I mean, in Detroit, you can understand why they would think self-driving cars were a good thing because what Detroit is good at is making cars and anything that would allow them to extend that, you know, would be something interesting. What I didn't understand was why um, the tech industry wanted to jump uh, into cars. Um, of course, part of it has to do with California, but, um, you know, what I what I, what happened is the, the way we travel has changed, and just a really broad appreciation of that coming at a time when this this whole new set of really general purpose technologies uh, for um, automating vehicles of all types uh, has arrived is really cracking open the door. And so that to me was was the big story um, that you know, a driverless revolution is coming. And these were some of the numbers that were being thrown around a couple of years ago when I started working on this book that, you know, we're going to see a real trickle of self-driving vehicles coming to market. But then, you know, as the 2020s unfold, it would just explode. Um, and you would get sort of a, a, a sudden changeover um, to this technology as people, as the cost came down and people saw the benefits uh, of it. Uh, and again, you know, um, the 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 problem with that thesis is that I don't think um, I don't think that it's this is the form that we can expect. Uh, if anybody remembers, you know, or has seen the 1980s uh, show uh, Night Rider, you know, the idea of this like super intelligent car that's your companion and and uh, you know is your guardian even uh, is something that has really limited appeal. Um, and from a, a sort of planning public policy point of view, it's something that we may want to discourage in, in many, many cases. So the three big stories um, about the driverless future that, that I really saw going forward were, um, and you know, I phrase these as questions, is what happens when automation is something that isn't just about making cars work better, but it's about making all kinds of vehicles work better, bicycles, trucks, even wheelchairs, um, are being automated. Uh, and then, you know, and this was something that I think, um, you know, the book is roughly organized in thirds around these, these three questions. Um, I also started to look at, at why we were focusing so much on passenger travel as the killer application when all of the economic drivers uh, were pointing towards um, delivery as the, the real, like, first killer application for automated vehicles. And that was before the pandemic. And we've only, I think, more definitively moved into that future since then. And then the last part of the book really gets into um, the questions around um, the markets for automated mobility and what happens when um, uh, the kinds of things that are happening now with ride hail um, become even more accelerated and more seamless and urban mobility becomes something that is global 
um, is highly interconnected and controlled by a very small number of players uh, with very powerful predictive software. And the kind of forces of financialization that we've seen in other sectors really get unleashed in, in an unrestrained way on cities. So I'm going to talk, I'll talk about the first one quickly and then maybe we'll just open up and uh, see if there's any questions. So I think this is a pretty straightforward, um, pretty straightforward, uh, you know, topic. Um, you know, there's so many different kinds of vehicles that operate in cities, yet the, the, the conversation around um, self-driving vehicles has, has really just focused on, on mass-produced passenger cars. And um, I picked this picture because it, what I love about it is, is it shows you just kind of how ridiculous um, the, the, the marriage of, of passenger cars and um, this technology has been. Um, you know, this is like essentially like a, a Ford sedan, which doesn't really look that different from Ford sedans from say the 1940s, um, when they took on this modern form uh, with a hat on, a high tech hat. Um, and of course that hat will be miniaturized. And, but this is really sort of the way the industry has been thinking of this technology is we're gonna do things the same way we've done it for, for decades, almost a century. And we're just gonna put this thing on top of it. Um, and it's been a very, very unsophisticated approach. Whereas if you look at how other industries and other manufacturers and other, other, um, other kinds of, of operators have been coming at this, um, you see just, just what a potential there is um, to take all of the interesting things that are happening in mobility and juice them with uh, automation. So um, in France, uh, in particular, uh, because of some, some investments that the EU made about 10 years ago in a handful of um, urban mobility pilot projects, there were two manufacturers, Navia and Easy Mile, who um, had both uh, spent much of the last five years rolling out these, um, uh, what I call driverless shuttles, which are eight to 10 passenger uh, automated um, minivans or minibuses that are designed explicitly for last mile urban connectivity. Um, they can either run fixed routes, scheduled, they can operate on demand on dynamic uh, routes as well. Um, but these have now been piloted uh, in hundreds of cities around the world. They um, have operated on scheduled service. They've operated on, on fair producing service, like in real production transit networks, not just pilots. And in terms of numbers, this is probably, um, by a magnitude, a factor of 10, you know, more people have experienced riding in an automated vehicle uh, that's like this than, than a passenger car or any other, other kind of automated vehicle. Um, and so, you know, in, in many ways, like this, this is, if, if you're measuring strictly by separating like hype from fact from fiction, like this is the future of automated urban mobility because it's what's out there. Um, and we've seen a number of other manufacturers step in uh, and, and copy this. So in the US, there was uh, um, a company whose name is slipping my mind that was actually manufacturing vehicles like this in, uh, I believe in Knoxville, Tennessee, using um, the big 3D printer that is set up as part of the, um, what's uh, the, the national lab that's there, Oak Ridge National Lab has a manufacturing center of excellence there. That has, so they were printing these vehicles, um, which is really remarkable, um, a remarkable concept. Uh, there's a Russian maker of these, there's several Chinese ones. So this kind of form factor um, is one that has, um, has caught on um, and it solves an urban mobility problem that cities don't have a great technology for solving right now and, and have huge demand for. Um, so it very nicely fits with, with the, the mobility needs that cities have. Um, scooters and micro mobility, there's a lot of interest in using automation uh, in this sector. 
And then what's exciting here is that um, this is a great example of taking the technology out of the context where it was originally created, where it's incredibly, I mean, it has to work perfectly because you're dealing with a vehicle that weighs a couple tons, you know, and is carrying people and can cause a lot of harm to humans and property. And you're putting it in, in a context where it's not going to be moving much mass very quickly and the risk is very low. So if it doesn't work that great, it's actually okay. So um, this actually kind of um, makes the technology much more feasible. And um, it also changes the use case for the technology. Self-driving scooters, and there's even um, self-driving bicycles. The whole, um, the whole purpose of putting automation in these uh, vehicles is not for when the passengers are on the vehicle, it's for in between the rides. So either rebalancing or deadheading the vehicles from one, one uh, drop off to the next pickup. So the automation only kicks in when there's nobody on it, which again, reduces the risk and makes, makes the whole calculation. So this idea of sort of like good enough automation, as opposed to this um, moonshot of perfect self-driving passenger vehicles that are fantastically better than the best human driver, um, really, really changes the whole technology um, trajectory. Um, and, then, and then vehicles that we don't think of even as urban vehicles, yet are among some of the fastest growing um, categories of vehicles in a world that's increasingly urban, increasingly old, increasingly sick, yet is capable of producing very cheap, very, um, you know, long range electric motors and batteries. Uh, and that's wheelchairs. Um, so Hitachi, which is the world's largest maker of, um, of electric wheelchairs, has a very active uh, autonomous uh, research program going on. And they've been looking at um, these, particularly for airports, um, to cut down, you know, to make it easier and cheaper to provide assistive mobility in airports for people that need it, um, but also to reduce the cost of doing it uh, for the airport operators. Um, so you can see, um, you know, you can see the, the other interesting thing about this, and I always ask this when I see new automated vehicles come around, who's gonna pay for it, right? Um, in this case, it might be, you know, uh, insurers. So who, who paid for all of those electric wheelchairs that were sold across America over the last 15, 20 years? It was, you know, insurers and Medicare. Um, and so it's possible that, that they may pay for the, um, you know, the independence and the autonomy that devices like this could provide to tens of millions of people in the next 10 years. And that might actually have a tremendous social value. Um, in allowing those people to, to continue to access the things that they need outside their home. So it's a very, very, once you get away from thinking about this as just about cars, you open up all kinds of doors um, into very, very interesting and, and potentially very problematic um, spaces. So looking at technologies like these self-driving wheelchairs or scooters, um, any urban planner or designer immediately has to start asking themselves questions about what does this mean for walkability and pedestrian spaces? And the, the conflicts are potentially massive and catastrophic. And the answer is yes, 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 and yes. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. But I just want to stop there and see if anybody had any comments or questions or observations about this idea of sort of uh, all flavors of automated vehicles invading our urban world. Actually, I'm curious, has anybody ever ridden in, a, in an automated vehicle? Before I start sharing my, my stories. <laughs> All right, well, I like uncomfortable silences, but um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you guys another few seconds to uh, to unclick, and then I'll, I'll move forward. Oh, I see some, some chat room activity. People are commenting. 
Oh, okay. So that's where you guys are talking. There isn't like some secret Discord channel somewhere where you guys are playing, um, playing video games and. Should I ask people? Uh, good stuff. No, it? this is this is no, this is great. So yeah. some of you have ridden in uh, some driverless shuttles, which I like. I said, I mean, I think that's, um, I think that's, uh, I'm not surprised that that uh, and Tesla's some of us have been Tesla's. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I think this is um, it's interesting. Um, you know, I think over the next couple of years, we're all going to have opportunities to engage with this technology. And I think um, one thing to, to watch out for is uh, where and how uh, manufacturers or whoever is is offering you that that service chooses to present it. Um, you know, what, what is it that, um, that they're trying to, to deliver to you? Um, what I suspect is that a lot of us are going to encounter these things in places where our guard is down at um, sporting arenas, on vacation at airports in the Sun Belt. Um, other locations where, you know, we're going to be open to, to trying something new. Um, and I think like that's how, that's how um, these products are introduced to the public um, in order to give people, you know, often celebrities, uh, you know, as ambassadors to, to try to get us to, to have a good feeling. And, and um, you know, it's something that's going to be, it's going to be a real sort of spoon fed sweet cell. Um, and I think that like that's that's going to be a really good way to kind of try to decode um, some of the intentions and meanings and in the way that that um, that mobility and all the other things that come with it are being bundled uh, into these into these products. So definitely something to keep your eye out on. Um, one thing that I think is, is super important um, to keep your eye on. Uh, I was I was keyed into this before the pandemic happened. Um, like I said, the book came out three months after the lockdown started, and my publisher said, "You sure you want to publish this? You want to change anything? We can't really change anything; it's already been printed." And I said, "Okay, well, thanks for that." Um, I went and reread the the book anyway, and this was the part that I said I wouldn't change a word of it. Um, that it's the shortest part of the book because um, you know it's 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 really sort of one point, which is um, you know, that the risk of putting stuff into a robot and sending it out on the roads is gonna be much lower than putting people into a robot and sending it out on the roads. And the economic payoff is gonna be much more immediate and much larger. And that was true before the pandemic and uh, it's five times as true now. Um, this is sort of what, you know, even in 2018, 2019, you know, your average morning, uh, this is Herald Square in Midtown Manhattan looks like. Um, I love showing this to, to urbanists because this is a bike share station uh, where all the bikes are gone because, um, you know, they've all been checked out um, for trips to other places. This is right on top of probably the third largest railhead in the city. And the bike share station has been taken over as an illegal impromptu package sorting station by a group of FedEx drivers. So this is literally, you know, the overflow of consumer package parcel shipments, you know, swamping um, the city's best efforts to do zero carbon human mobility. And I think it highlights just the tremendous conflicts um, that the surge in e-commerce was already driving. Um, so 2018 is a real important year because that's the first time that there's more packages moving around the U.S. going from businesses to consumers than from businesses to businesses. And that's the first time that that's happened. That's a big shift for, for, for transportation planners because transportation planners have always thought as, as freight and moving freight as an industrial activity. And it's one of the reasons why they haven't really paid much attention to it in cities for the last 50 years. As soon as factories started closing, ports started shrinking, um, with the exception of a handful of areas around airports, 
and and seaports. Um, you know, people, planners and, and policymakers in cities just have not thought much about this. Um, and so, you know, you, you look at a transportation planning department and there might be a couple people in the basement um, crying out for attention who uh, are experts on, on freight movement. They're suddenly now getting a lot of attention because um, these numbers are growing, growing very quickly. Automation is, is a huge uh, issue. Uh, it's a huge opportunity throughout the entire um, supply chain uh, for these big e-commerce uh, retailers that are driving most of this traffic. And in the US, it's really Amazon and Walmart and everything else is kind of a rounding error. Uh, and they're, they're in this battle for, for dominance. And if you just look at um, you know, what goes into their cost structure, about half of it is what they pay the drivers. And so reducing the labor component um, is where automation really starts to have a, a huge impact. Um, being able to operate more efficiently through automation or at least have more predictability than you might with human drivers um, who have a huge variability between experienced and inexperienced drivers um, allows you to get control of that fuel cost thing too as well. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal. Um, and up until now, um, the automation pieces mostly happen inside warehouses uh, or inside ports. But over the next decade or so, I think we're gonna see it start spilling out a lot out into the streets. Now this was a um, concept uh, that came out of IDEO in San Francisco about four years ago. Um, and it was for a vehicle that they called a, a delivery mule. And essentially this was, um, this was intended to replace the dozen or so delivery trucks scuttling around your neighborhood each day, making door-to-door -door deliveries and pickups, uh, you know, spewing pollution and noise and creating safety risks and replace that with a single vehicle that could go park um, you know, at a central location and essentially serve as a, as a mobile package locker uh, and both make deliveries and take returns as well. Um, and returns is a really interesting part of all this because something like, uh, if you look at like, it depends on which category, but for apparel, uh, clothing, something like 40% of what gets shipped out by Amazon gets returned. And it is, it is a tremendously expensive and wasteful process. And it's one of the main like things that they're trying to control the costs for. Um, and so all of the re-engineering of these delivery chains that's going on right now is also in the process grafting a return chain onto it that is less wasteful and able to recover more of the goods that get returned and then resell them. Uh, than has historically been the case. And so they not only need to take the goods back more quickly and cheaply, but also in better condition um, and you know, restock them and, and get them back out more quickly. Um, so this was a really interesting concept. Um, package lockers are a really interesting um, kind of design space in this whole uh, logistics and delivery world in that they haven't been terribly successful in the United States. There's other parts of the world where they are very successful and they're actually a really important part of um, zero emission local delivery networks. So in a lot of European cities, um, they have implemented f freight consolidation centers. So delivery trucks don't enter the city center. They all come to a single depot um, usually on the on the outskirts of a central neighborhood, and then packages go by cargo bike or elect small electric vehicle from there to like local retailers or local post offices where people pick up their packages. Unfortunately, Americans have just become accustomed to door-to-door -door delivery, and package lockers have not caught on here. Um, and it's not clear whether you know we're not. Retailers aren't using enough carrots or sticks to get people to use them, but 
Um, it's the kind of thing that architect, I see architects and urban designers like keep and, and product designers keep coming at this thing of, we're gonna use package lockers, we're gonna use package lockers. And every time it goes into the market in the US, it fails miserably. Um, I love using them. I don't, I don't know why others don't, but it's, uh, it's a nut that someone's gonna have to crack at some point to make this all work. Um, this uh, is another answer to that, um, that problem of the last meter, not even the last mile. Um, so Starship, KiwiBot, there's a whole number of startups that have developed uh, what I call conveyors. I think of them as sort of automated versions of the little buckets on conveyor belts in, in factories. Um, a lot of what I've done in the book is just develop a vocabulary for these, these new vehicles and services. Um, so this is actually, uh, I think this was in Milton Keynes, in, uh, which is a planned city, um, one of the last of the big garden cities, um, kind of planned communities uh, of the 70s in the UK, which was the site of a um, massive uh, rollout of the, these um, devices. Uh, and one of the reasons being that um, Milton Keynes has a separate network of bicycle and pedestrian pathways. So it had the right of way in place for these vehicles to operate because they're not roadworthy. They can't operate on, on um, like motorways and streets. They need to be in pedestrianized spaces basically. Um, these, this is an interesting technology as well too, because um, many of the companies that are operating these devices, um, don't put a lot of sophisticated technology on board the device, but they bolster it with a remote teleoperation. So KiwiBot, which is one of the US companies that makes devices like these, they have very limited self-driving technology on board the device, but it's paired with a remote, uh, essentially like a drone uh, pilot center in Bogota and if the device encounters something, uh, and basically that the remote operators in Bogota plot a series of waypoints along the sidewalk for the device to drive, and it can navigate itself around some basic obstacles, but if it encounters something it can't deal with, it can phone home for help. Um, and then, I mean, it's fascinating for all kinds of reasons. You know, essentially we're, we're driving the groceries around the same way we drive predator drones around in combat areas. Um, but also the wage arbitrage that's happening. Um, those operators, are, they're mostly students uh, in Colombia, mostly students who see it as an opportunity to get into the tech sector, even though it's at a very low skill level, um, it's, a, it's a considered a good opportunity and they're paid relatively low. You know, it's a few dollars an hour, um, but um, there's actually, you know, Quite, quite a great deal of goodwill around the company doing this in Colombia. It's seen as a, as a beneficial industry for, for the country. Um, and so, you know, we may see um, these kinds of, of uh, like offshoring plays, um, you know, around automated vehicle teleoperation. Um, I did some work, consulting work last year that was looking up at setting up a teleoperations center for um, undersea drones in Mississippi in the United States um, because Mississippi for a whole bunch of reasons is interested in undersea drones because uh, they have a big Navy presence there. And we looked at what were all the opportunities and one of them was, you know, a remote piloting center for these things because uh, in 10 years it could be a huge business. So this is the kind of thing, I don't think anybody ever thought like this could be an opportunity. Um, that we might have a whole city, you know, popping up somewhere whose industry is essentially, you know, piloting robots around in other cities. Um, but these are the kinds of, of things that, uh, that this world is, is, um, is creating for us. Um, the, the much more immediate market for this kind of teleoperation is going to be trucking because trucking is where the economic need for this uh, is really, really acute and that the technology is lining up. There's a massive labor shortage in the United States in long haul trucking right now. Um, we need drivers and nobody wants to do the jobs uh, at the prevailing wage rates. 
Uh, and so that solution is going to get used in long haul trucking very, very quickly. Um, so somewhere in the heartland, there's going to be big, you know, warehouses full of people playing truck video games for money, uh, which I think is, is fascinating. So let me um, jump into this financialization piece. Um, actually, you know what? I'm been going on for a while. I'm going to skip this because it's it's um, it's a little bit of a detour, and I want to get to the um, the urban planning stuff, which is this is a lot of fun um, pictures here. So. Okay, so you know, it's a lot of technology, a lot of business talk. Um, what about cities? When I started thinking about this, there were really two schools of thought um, about what self-driving vehicles, and again, when people talk about self-driving vehicles, they're mostly thinking about self-driving cars. What does that mean for cities? And it was, I, I sort of boiled it down into, Self-driving suburbs. So there's one school of thought that is sometimes people saying this is a good thing. Often people saying this is a terrible thing that we're basically doubling down on the kinds of autocentric sprawl. We're perfecting the automobile. Um, and, you know, we could essentially extend that paradigm out into, you know, the exurban frontier as far as, as far as we want because the opportunity costs of driving essentially evaporate. Um, then there's another school of thought, uh, which I call car-like communes. And I'm being trying to be very antagonistic here um, to both sides, <laughs> trying to provoke people um, that essentially sees this as a panacea for shared mobility, that we can get rid of all private automobiles because um, there will be no need to uh, you know, keep your own car on your own car when you can snap your fingers and have a shared car. And that could, could free up road space, eliminate parking, all of the sort of um, vestigial space in cities that we use to accommodate private automobiles. Um, so we can have automobility, use up less land and energy to do it, and then you know get all the benefits of having that back. So what you know I realized was that both of these schools were looking at this technology through um, their own values and aspirations, seeing you know, how it could be instrumental to achieve what they wanted to achieve before it came along, and not really taking an honest look at the technology itself and what it could make possible. Um, you know, I'm an urbanist. I, I believe in sound progressive mobility. And you know, I come down on one side of this most of the time, but you know, I also see that there's a lot of legacy in this country and a lot of people who choose to live another way. Um, a lot of people are forced to live another way by bad policy, but um, it's something, it's just a reality we have to deal with. There's a lot of people who um, don't have alternatives to automobiles, so they will adopt self-driving automobiles. So how do we make that better? So I was trying to think about, you know, what is it about this technology um, that might, um, you know, what kinds of doors and possibilities might that open? And so that was really the thought experiment. And what I was started with was, okay, let's not come at this with, um, is my window being shared? Yes, it is. Oh, okay, because it says sharing is pause, bring your shared window to the front. I just want to make sure. So you see my slides? Yes, but it's not full um, full screen, if that's what you oh. yeah. Okay. Has it been like that the whole time? Uh, only a few moments ago. So oh, okay, cool. I always love it when you're talk like I'm giving a lecture about technology and everything's going haywire in the background. Um, all right, let's see. There we go. I'm screen sharing. I've got the green. Okay. So what I tried to do is basically um, try to really map out like what are the forces about automated mobility kind of um, 
driving concentration that might um, sort of reinforce urbanization and what are the forces that might push us apart or be sort of centrifugal like when you're you know spinning on a top at a playground and, and you let go and you fly off um, so distance based fares this is something we see with ride hail already um, that you don't have when you buy a car you buy a car and for the most part you drive it as much as you can because you spend a lot to get it um, ride sharing certainly um, allows people to reduce the cost of driving and ride sharing works best when there's a lot of demand in the same area. Uh, now service foot, footprints is, is another one. <clears throat> so if we move to more um, kinds of services powered by automotive, automated mobility um, and you're not within the area that's served by that, um, you're, you're, you know, you're out of luck. So um, I, I definitely have seen um, apartments and neighborhoods in uh, the New York area um, go through transformations when Uber service, you know, ride hail service became available. Um, you know, scooter service, like those kinds of things have, have become very important to people. I've been trying to keep my eye on whether the uh, housing market is taking account of um, delivery times because there are certain neighborhoods that, you know, you can click on something on Amazon and you will get it like a few hours later because they're that close to, um, to that close to the depots. And I think those kinds of things will matter to people as well. Oh, so delivery speed, there was number four. And then um, this is a little bit more abstract, but um, you know, I think all technologies, technologies of automation, and if you wanna really understand this on the simplest level, Automatic elevators and traffic traffic signals are two that, that make this point very clearly. Those two technologies made it possible to pack more people into big cities than was possible before that by coordinating the flow of people. You suddenly you could move people up into very tall buildings. So you could pack more people per square mile and automated traffic signals unsnarled the streets that were, you know, before that completely clogged. So by bringing order and control, all automation technologies sort of allow the center of cities to become more efficient and, and do more. Um, so those things all favor sort of concentration. And then parts of sort of aspects of automation that enable dispersal, um, what I said, like the opportunity costs, um, you may, this is very speculative, be able to do other things instead of paying attention to driving. Um, I write at length about this in the book that the actual survey and ethnographic research shows the exact opposite. Um, that people will not use this for economically productive activity. They will sleep, video games, they will text, do social stuff. Um, most policymakers are banking on a big economic payout from um, this kind of regained productive time from automated vehicles, it's not gonna happen, <laughs> I can guarantee. Um, this rent rising thing, um, this re relates to number five, that the more productive you make the center, the more expensive it gets, and that will push people away. So there's sort of a balancing going on there. Um, and I kind of glossed over this before, but um, the, the natural endpoint, and this is kind of a fascinating thing to think about, of, of uh, full automation of, of uh, shipping and deliveries is essentially, um, you know, what happened with text messaging, that we go from, uh, we go from a world where, you know, something is, is easily available, it's cheap, it's fast, but it's still metered, you know, you still have to pay 20 cents, 10 cents a text message to, to a world where it's, it's basically costs nothing um, to ship something across town. And, um, you know, thinking about the volume of, of shipments and goods that that would, the kinds of things you might send to people. Um, I raised the specter in the book of physical spam. Um, so junk mail, but stuff coming to your house that you have to kind of swipe away. So companies just, just preemptively trying to sell you things by just sending it to you because it costs nothing. Um, 
that's a real extreme scenario, but um, it's one that's been imagined in science fiction. And there's certainly a future where it's, it's a nightmare, of course, from an environmental point of view, unless we could find a way to do it at no carbon costs. But um, this is sort of from an economic technological point of view, this, this is a world we may move into. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, 10 years ago, if I had told you you'd be getting all these spam text messages every day, you might not have believed me, but um, that's kind of where we are now. Um, so another exercise uh, that I did in the book was to try to sort of plot out what some of these changes uh, might look like on uh, sort of your, your generic metropolitan area. And to do that, I borrowed um, a, a pedago pedagogical tool that the new urbanists um, popularized in the 90s called the transect, uh, which divides cities into six or seven zones. Um, think of it as sort of like a cross section, like the rings of a tree. Um, and they used it to, to really teach people about density and how you know cities are most effective when they're designed to have transitions in density from the core to, to the interface with, with the, um, the natural wilderness around the city and uh, the different kinds of activities that can, can be located um, you know, in each of those zones. So I thought that this was a good way of thinking about. So if we start in the center and kind of take a slice um, of the future city what um, what kinds of changes could could automation render, uh, or could we render with automation? So I sim simplified it down to four zones in this cross section, and we'll just quickly walk through them, and then I'll I'll wrap up. So the first is just the core, um, and the kinds of things going on here um, are some of the things that I talked about. So driverless shuttles operating. Um, we see some some driverless taxis doing the thing. Certainly a lot of cargo moving around. Um, you can't really see it because I think I cut it off, but um, this building in the upper left-hand corner where the, the little red cargo box conveyor is going into, that's an old parking lot and they're called the apartments. Um, you see above it is a semicode indicating that that's, that's a, a machine only entrance. Um, so that is not a human entrance. Um, over on the on the right, you see some buses, automated buses that have sort of paired up uh, virtually into a train. So they've made themselves into a, a longer coach. And then um, some little robot type thingies that have blocked off a street temporarily. Um, and so we see kind of the blurring between um, what is an automated vehicle and what's just a robot operating in the city. Um, doing things to make the city, you know, more comfortable and more appealing for human beings by blocking off protected spaces. Um, so I think this is just kind of like, really just like a pastiche of, uh, oh, there's the apartments. So you can see um, some of the adaptive reuses that are kind of unlocked. Um, this is a illustration from a scenario that we did for Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, in 2018 and the National League of Cities. I was really trying to imagine um, what, um, what kinds of new mobility systems might emerge when lots of um, these driverless shuttles started operating and potentially you had like overlapping networks of driverless shuttles. So imagine like your university and a big employer both operating uh, converting their existing shuttle networks, student shuttles and employee shuttles to parking or to downtown to transit to these kinds of systems. Um, you know, would it be possible to think about interconnecting them? Um, because both would have automated dispatching and routing and driving, and both would also have some kind of rider ID verification system. And so if the two institutions could find a way to trust each other, and trust each other's people, they might be able to find a way to say, you know what, it's okay if company X, um, if somebody is headed towards the university, they can hop on the university shuttle. And in exchange, it's okay if the students use the company shuttle, if it goes someplace they need to go. And so we sort of imagined an uh, ad hoc kind of mesh network of these, these shuttles 
um, building up into a um, into almost a replica of a citywide network, um, allowing you know people to make much more efficient journeys and allowing these vehicles to operate at, at a higher capacity throughout the cities, um, but without being necessarily centrally planned. I'm going to skip this one because the video doesn't really work that well. Oops. Uh, so the second zone <clears throat> is what I call the fulfillment zone. Um, and this is sort of like, you know, you know the loft district of the, of the driverless city. Um, in this illustration, it's centered around a shopping mall, uh, which has been converted essentially into like a mixed use urban district. And there's all kinds of things going on here. Um, but, you know, really what we're seeing is trade, commerce, a lot of um, different kinds of, of automated vehicles supporting a very, very rich array of productive activity. Um, and, uh, you know, it's everything from these uh, containers being sort of bandied about um, to, uh, and, 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 you know, one of the inspirations for this is um, what is happening today inside uh, Amazon fulfillment centers, inside basically, you know, the, the global e-commerce system. Um, these are, like, I look at, I look at uh, you know, what happens, you know, on a sort of continual basis inside Amazon's warehouses. And, and to me, this is, this is the prototype for, you know, at least part of the future city. Um, you know, so many different aspects of this. Uh, the separation of humans and um, and robots. Uh, there's a lot of really undesirable things about it. You know, the human being is is really isolated and segregated, and the, the whole geometry of this, the whole form, is organized around allowing the robots to move as fast and as compact, um, you know, in an unimpeded a way as possible. Um, but uh, there is a logic to it that I think is, is something that we're going to have to grapple with. Uh, this is also a business that um, people like Travis Kalanick are getting into. So this is one of the buildings that he's bought um, to convert into a hub for ghost kitchens, uh, which um, you know are, are sort of restaurants that only exist on the internet. And so this idea of the fulfillment zone as a place where um, internet commerce uh, automated mobility, automated delivery is being used to serve the population of the core, the urban core um, from a sort of like uh, uh, back office retail location is something that's it's being built now. So this is really part of the inspiration. It's also being incorporated into future plants. So this is one of the sketches of uh, Jurong uh, Lake District in Singapore. And, you know, this is a new CBD for Singapore. Uh, it's roughly being built on a 2035 timeline, and it's it's being built on the assumption that it's going to have a third of the retail space that um, the downtown, the CBD in Singapore does today. And it's essentially a city built on top of a distribution center. So underneath it will be a massive, you know, system for moving packages uh, so that that stuff doesn't have to occupy the valuable um, surface space. And the space that would have been, you know, put to retail is going to be used for civic uses instead. And I'm going to skip this because sidewalk is dead. <laughs> um, I think one of the really exciting things about thinking about automated delivery is what it allows um, in terms of like uh, chronology. So this is a kind of old sketch um, that uh, we did in 2014. Um, a set of scenarios called reprogramming mobility. And what we were really looking at there um, was, uh, you know, not where does the freight go in the future city, but when does it go? Um, and uh, trying to understand um, in the downtown crossing area in Boston, which is a pedestrianized, pedestrianized intersection on top of a transit hub, you know, um, but it's just very desolate at night. And is this a space that could be um, temporarily lent over to robots to, um, you know, do this sort of dull, dangerous, dirty business of keeping the city running 
replenishing stocks and, and doing maintenance and all the other things um, to keep the streets free of heavy vehicles during the day. And there's a, there's a lot of interest, particularly as um, we move to electric, uh, electric drive across commercial fleets in uh, allowing a lot of this stuff to happen at night. Once you can also automate the receiving end of these deliveries, you can really, really drive the cost of doing night deliveries down. And uh, it becomes a really appealing prospect. And the shippers like it too, because allowing them to do their deliveries at night uh, means that, that they don't have to deal with traffic and they can be much more efficient in their operations. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of kind of crazy things uh, on the drawing board. This was actually a, a completely made up uh, film, but based on a real Amazon patent uh, for a, a airship, essentially a distribution center in an airship. And I think the thinking at Amazon was that they would park these over like sp sporting events or over neighborhoods at the holidays, uh, load them up with, you know, commonly ordered items. And, you know, essentially the purchases would just glide down to the purchasers. Um, it's actually an incredibly, I mean, the mind bogglingly carbon efficient way to deliver goods because um, airships are very, very efficient at lifting, doing heavy lifting. Um, the flight path for the delivery to the customer is almost all gliding. So it's just sort of dead drop. Um, and then when the drone flies back up, it's empty. So it's, it has a very light load. So while it looks incredibly terrifying, this might actually be, you know, one of the better paths for us to think about if we're going to be delivering a lot of goods, um, you know, to a distributed set of locations in the city in the future. And so I think, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we're confronted with when, when we really investigate these technologies and what it means for, for urban systems is that some of the most <laughs> terrifying um, proposals, you know, when you scrutinize them actually have a lot of really appealing characteristics and the trade-offs are just incredibly complex um, and we need, to, we need to really, really explore them. So I'll just real quick move through these last two zones. Um, this is, um, uh, oh my God, I'm completely blanking on what I, I called this zone. Um, but it's sort of the, um, it's sort of like the, uh, the residential zone of the city. Um, and the, the, the chief kind of, the big story here uh, about automation is, is densification and the ability to get rid of, of passenger cars and use, um, both um, uh, automated transit and particularly buses, as well as uh, automated personal electric vehicles to um, create just massive transit oriented neighborhoods, far bigger than the ones we have now, which depend upon walking uh, to, to bring people from their homes to the transit hub. And so this is a way of thinking about transit oriented neighborhoods that could be much cheaper to roll out. They could kind of spread out in ways that are different than they do now. Um, you know, and, and really the, the, key, uh, the key number here is, you know, how far you can get on, a, on an electric scooter or an electric bike in 10 or 15 minutes, as opposed to how far you can walk. And the, like the land area that gets, becomes transit accessible when you're scooting or biking, uh, as opposed to walking, is a it's a factor of 25. I mean, it's just a massive, um, it's a massive expansion. Um, um, of course, these then aren't really walkable neighborhoods in our conventional sense. So I think they're very, um, they're very different potential kind of configuration than anything. Again, this is all very speculative, but uh, a lot of what I was trying to do here was think like, well, what are the like, what could this allow us to do? Um, the transit hub that's at the center of this is also a very unconventional transit hub. It's, it's a transit hub that's built around bus rapid transit, 
but it's automated buses that are able to to chain up to form very very large capacity high capacity vehicles that can also move very very quickly um, and so you know that also starts to unlock some some different possibilities um, you know and really just contrasting the kind of um, old neighborhoods of the past with the new ones. Um, you know, I, I'm really excited about um, the possibilities of, of automation in micromobility because it can solve some of the problems that have, um, you know, caused objections. So, um, you know, scooters piling up uh, in public places self-driving scooter can tuck itself down an alley or into an underused parking garage when it's not in use. Uh, it can take itself to get recharged. During a pandemic, it can take itself for disinfection. Um, this is a visualization from our, our work with Bloomberg of uh, these uh, self-driving bus rapid transit forming into a platoon in Sao Paulo. And the, the letters A, B, and C indicate that um, these coaches are actually operating in split mode service. So while they'll travel together on the trunk portion of the route, they'll actually split off at some point down the line and serve different endpoints, which is something that's completely impossible uh, without this kind of technology. Of course, it requires people to get on the right coach or they end up in the wrong place. Um, but, uh, you know, people are very, very flexible. So we were trying to not just understand how to make existing services better, but what's new that you could never do before um, when you start to think this way. So here you see them splitting off and going to different endpoints. Um, this is just an example of uh, you know how industry is starting to grapple with some of the possibilities of, of automated mobility. IKEA um, started to essentially imagine um, you know what what kinds of different spaces you might put into container sized automated buildings and zip around the city, whether it's health clinics or schools or government services or um, just a little workspace like this. So the last, um, the last zone we looked at was really the, the frontier. And I, I call this Desicota, which was a term that uh, the geographer Terry McGee developed probably 20 years ago to describe um, a pattern of, of peri-urban development that he had, uh, he had studied in Southeast Asia that was sort of neither urban nor rural, but sort of a, a mixture of both that was prevalent in Indonesia and the Philippines and, and other parts of, of, um, of that region. And the reason I, I picked that in addition to it just being a great word does it really describe this sort of mish, mishmash of both industrial and um, intensive agriculture um, and logistics kinds of functions that automated mobility can unlock out in the periphery? And um, you know things like automated trucking, um, which are going to potentially move a lot of the warehousing that we see on the outskirts of big metros now far into the interior. Um, to the really intensive, large-scale kinds of automated agriculture that's already happening and has been happening for a long time, just being replicated on a, on a whole different scale across the continent. Um, you know, automated uh, mobility was originally invented to traverse like big open spaces. So, you know, it was invented to explore other planets. It was invented to explore the spaces between planets. It was invented. Um, for combat operations in remote parts of the world. And it's only now that it's like being mapped back into the city, into congested spaces, into spaces where human beings are and into spaces where, you know, it needs to protect human beings instead of try to harm them. So um, it's a very weird road this technology has taken, but it's going to continue to operate at all these scales. Uh, oh, micro sprawl. That was the, that was the name for that, that third zone. Um, yeah, it was really, we were just trying to get at like the idea that you could have a new form emerge that's both transit oriented yet to our eyes, very sprawly looking. Um, so, you know, I think it's just sort of like a catalog of possibilities here. Some of which 
are appealing in some ways and some of which are probably kind of somewhat, somewhat uh, frightening, uh, but they all represent spaces for design. And um, you know, the whole point of all this is to really break the narrative of like automated mobility is going to do something or going to cause something. To me, it's, it's an incredibly versatile set of technologies that's going to bend to uh, the way we put it into products. It's gonna bend to the regulations we write, whether it's regulating the industry, safety, whether it's regulating how it's used in urban transportation. Um, and it's gonna bend to you know, the, the sort of values and goals that we articulate for what we want future cities to look like. Um, so you know, one great question that's probably you know, worth putting on the table, it's, it's what the, the title of Ghost Road is trying to evoke is like, um, in a lot of these images, you see people and automated vehicles separated or you see people in automated vehicles operating spaces together. And there's a lot of reasons why I and others have chosen one or the other. And I think that's one of the big questions is, um, you know, do we want humans and these supposedly intelligent machines in close proximity or do we wanna keep them apart? And if so, why, you know, when, where, and why? So I'll stop there. Um, hope I haven't completely exhausted our time, but I'll stick around for, um, you know, at least another 15 minutes. So um, I'll start, I have a couple of questions and then mm -hmm. we'll move on to people's um, questions. So the first one is, you said something that's very striking, that sidewalk is dead. So I was wondering, oh. what, yeah, <laughs> what, what will replace that? Because there are some people for whom, um, walk using the pedestrian the sidewalk is um, a very important means of transportation so i'm thinking about wheelchair users for instance i didn't mean the sidewalk i meant sidewalk labs the, oh, i had a picture okay. of the sidewalk toronto project i see okay <laughs> yeah. I'm totally misunderstanding from my yeah, yeah yeah okay yeah. so i'll just move. No, that to that was a what i had shown was a picture of the sidewalk toronto ah uh, okay uh, their original proposal was to put all of their freight delivery in underground tunnels. Okay. And that's an idea that has a long history and it's a really poor idea. Um, it's dangerous and, and obsolete. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. No, I think sidewalks are great. Um, <laughs> Good, and we would like to keep them. But, but sidewalks are a great example. And this is something that's already come up in multiple places where um, some of the smaller, um, smaller like freight vehicles like the the um uh kiwi bot and uh starship um you know they can only operate on sidewalks or in bike lanes and you know question is should they um can they what restrictions should be placed on them how much is too much um in Pennsylvania, uh, those those were uh, the law that authorized, you know, pretty widespread use of those kinds of vehicles had a very high weight limit of like 500 pounds, and people were astonished by that because once you get into that territory, it actually does become pretty dangerous. Whereas a lot of other jurisdictions, like San Francisco's, was 50 pounds. Um, so that's, I mean, sidewalks are probably the, the space where that question of, of cohabitation of machines and people has already been fought a few skirmishes. Okay. Um, if you can quickly comment on public trust of autonomous vehicles and as the, the, the opportunity there to expand or to enable transportation systems for persons with disabilities. And also, if you can talk about the cost of um, autonomous vehicles for private use and the equity implications. And if you can. Yeah, um, I, you know, I don't think there's, there's been, I, I'm not familiar with anything that's looked specifically at that first issue. Um, I think that most of the, the 
there's been a lot of hype, let's say, um, that I, I don't know. I suspect that the I suspect that there was probably a, a lot of uh, interest and excitement about um, you know the potential for the technology in the disabled community, but a lot of that um, a lot of that messaging has fallen off, and I'm I'd be curious to know why that is. Um, I think maybe there's a lot of wait and see going on because. Um, I think it's going to be a while before the technology is, is capable enough, you know, to allow um, that kind of operation. Um, as far as cost um, and equity, yeah, I mean, Tesla is selling essentially a ten thousand dollar option for full self driving, which is the most expensive like in car navigation system that's ever been sold. So it's going to be it's going to be a luxury, um, but you also see it entering the mass market. GM has been pushing it in down into their product line, and, and others are as well. Um, and uh, to the extent that it enables low-cost shared mobility or low-cost ride hail, it could be a, a door opener um, for for more people to have you know access to to lower-cost mobility services. Um, one of the Questions I raise in the book, though, is if the business model <clears throat> of the web becomes the business model for automated mobility, then we're in for some trouble, because then you you basically get into a world where um, the monetization of automated mobility is your attention, uh, and um, rich people will be able to buy their way out of that inside their own automated vehicles. And so their screens inside their private AVs will be their screens to do what they want with. Whereas the screens inside your self-driving Uber or Waymo, um, or now Amazon Zooks uh, is going to be advertising driven. And you're gonna be literally inside the computer um, being surveilled and, and marketed at. And it's sort of all of the bad things that we've been through over the last decade, amplified, um, you know, to a point where you're, you're literally a prisoner inside that system for the time that you're um, the time that you're in in the vehicle, um, and, and that's like a really scary scenario, um, you know, that essentially, like you're you're bartering that uh, in order to get the mobility. And I think it's a very realistic scenario. So. Thank you. So if you don't mind um, stopping, if you could stop sharing yeah. the screen so we could um, see people. Um, people. So there, were, there were a few um, comments. So um, I'll just start with the last one. I think Dr. Wong. Yeah, it was a comment. Um, there is one question from Nick. Um, how do you save cities and towns that have been economically impacted by autonomous technology? I don't know if any have, um, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, there might be a few ports, um, but those have probably been positively impacted by it. Um, you know, the, the ports that have adopted autonomous vehicles, Rotterdam, Singapore, um, are very land constrained. And the reason they've adopted it is to continue to be competitive. Um, so were it not for, for that technology, they would not be, you know, competitive ports anymore. And so they would have closed or, you know, lost out to other, other ports. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know of any that are, um, I, I think it's it's something that is going to be, uh, there are going to be occupation categories that suffer. Um, and I, I wrote at length in the book about the research that's been done. Um, none of it's very conclusive, um, but the consensus seems to be that the, the pace of 
job loss in driving occupations is slow and small enough that if we choose to, we can retrain people. Um, so it's, it's a solvable problem if the political will is there. But, um, you know, as we have seen from like, you know, deindustrialization in the last 20 years, like it will be regionally uneven. And, you know, if concerted effort isn't taken to address that unevenness, you can create a lot of problems. Um, so, I, you know, and I think it's going to hit the same parts of the US that, that those, those job losses hit. So, um, on the other hand, there's going to be opportunities with things like, like teleoperation that I think have to be very aggressively exploited. And when I did this work in Mississippi, I mean, we, it was, it was a, a risky yet achievable ambition. And there was a lot of, um, I would say, serious attention paid to it. Um, and I think that's the kind of thinking that will you know, help places succeed for sure. Um, the other question is um, about employment. I think it's sort of similar. Um, yeah. If there's any more you would like to ask to add, please go ahead. Uh, but this is about displacement of delivery drivers and others through AV employment. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that's that's definitely. Um, I think that the the big job losses in the near term are going to happen in long haul trucking. Um, well let's say the big displacement. I don't know how much job losses there will be because there's already such a huge shortage of drivers that, you know, you could add all the automated vehicles and basically just make up for the, the new people that aren't going to be hired because they, they aren't there. Um, there's so much attrition in that space and the, it, there's so much demand. Um, so it may not be losses so much as just like labor force reductions that were going to happen anyway. Um, there are definitely, I think, counterproductive things happening. So the Transit Workers Union um, has mobilized massively against automation um, in, in transit, which I think is, is probably the most self-defeating position they could possibly take. Um, I have been working and I wrote at length in the book about the need for, for transit to, and the transit workforce to create a vision for itself that goes beyond driving and operating vehicles. Um, and that is about creating new crew functions, new roles that add value and transform transit into part of our, our civic infrastructure. Um, so, um, you know, aligning, aligning transit with all the other things we're trying to do in society, rethinking policing and how we intervene, you know, with, with things that are happening in the public realm, um, caring for elderly, dealing with dementia, um, you know, expanding education, um, you know, helping connect people <laughs> to economic opportunities, like, we shouldn't be paying people to sit behind a wheel and drive a bus. We should be training people to be social workers and public safety officers and putting them back in the passenger compartment where they can do things for people. Um, you know, we shouldn't be driving paratransit vehicles around, driving people to doctor's offices. We should have an automated minibus with, you know, an LPN in the back who can treat half the things that the people need and drop them back off at home before they even go to the doctor's office. Um, you know, th there's just a whole rethinking of that human resource that needs to be done that I don't think that union leadership has any sense of, of what the future looks like and steering in, in totally the wrong direction. It's really, really disappointing. Um, we have another question. Nancy asked, um, would these non-traditional vehicles also be capable of vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure communication, or would it not really be necessary? I, I mean, I think that's, that's a big, um, 
so that that stuff if you if you look at like how people in the industry um the sort of the new part of the industry talk about it they're very very hostile to those frameworks um, because they don't think they need it they think that's old auto industry government engineering it's been around forever it's slow it's not going anywhere and they can do it all um either on board or by talking to the cloud. Um, and they, you know, had a good 10 year sprint. They got really far. And now it's turning out that they, they actually do need that stuff. And all the old automotive and ITS engineers were right. And particularly when you get to more challenging environments outside the Sun Belt, like if you go to Canada, no one talks about autonomous mobility in Canada it's autonomous or automated and connected mobility because they know that none of this stuff works six months of the year when the ground's covered in snow. So um, I think, you know, this is part of the maturing of the whole sector that's happening, um, you know, as we speak that as the, the incredible methods, you know, particularly deep learning and computer vision, that Silicon Valley has brought in in the last 10 years that have made this big leap possible um, are sort of petering out. We're realizing that the, the two choices we have to, to, to bridge the last gap are either redesign the world to make it simpler for computer vision, which a lot of people in AI talk seriously about, and I, I really take that on, essentially redesign the world to make it more machine readable um, or, you know, upgrade the infrastructure and realize that it's smart cars and smart vehicles are going to need smart roads too. And that's going to require government action and it's going to require public investment. Um, there are efforts that are trying to thread the needle on that. The most interesting right now is what Sidewalk Infrastructure Partners is doing with the state of Michigan. And they're looking at, um, essentially financing a, a AV capable corridor uh, from Detroit to Ann Arbor, I guess on I-10 or I-5, I don't even know. Um, that would be a, a bus rapid transit corridor that would also be open to toll paying uh, automated vehicles. And essentially the idea is, is can you finance this BRT corridor uh, you know, through, through uh, tolls? Um, and you know, not have the public on the hook for financing any of it, which uh, but get tremendous public benefit. And if that works, that could be a great model. Great. We also have another question from John. Does technology like the Boring Company fit into this context of autonomous vehicles? Uh, yeah. Only I, I'm not. A, I think the Boring Company is. You know. Um, Elon Musk likes to take on public monopolies, you know, like public engineering monopolies. So he figured out space launch and now he's trying to figure out tunneling. Um, and uh, I think, you know, they're gonna succeed. What they put in those tunnels, I have no idea. Um, you know, the things that they have proposed don't make a whole lot of sense but they're gonna, they built some great tunneling machines. They're building really cheap, fast tunnels and that could be transformative. What it has to do with automated mobility, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I think that's all the questions we have in the chat um, okay. feature. If people have more questions, yeah, feel free to ask. I have a, I have a quick question. Uh, so what's okay. the what's the potential for a personal flight in the next uh, 20, 30, however, however long is is flight per, on a personal level um, in the cards? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't followed that as closely because it's it's like a whole nother um, domain. And I, and I really even didn't dive too much into drones in the book because um, you know, my, my general perspective on that was um, aviation regulators are like among the most conservative people in government and change was going to be slow and particularly change in airspace over urban areas was going to be really slow. 
and um, unless unless you could, the transformative thing there would be doing something about the noise. Um, that th that would be that would be the key to unlocking it all. Um, and uh, I I, I kind of threw this in the, <laughs> the book, um, talking to David King at Arizona State. Like, if you want to, the, the one thing that that you know, people who care about cities could do to unlock uh any kind of like automated aviation future would be today would be to plant trees because we're going to need the canopy to shield us from the, from the noise 20 or 30 years from now um i mean i think i think the big the big um but but to your point um there is a lot of money going into it now and and i think um i think there will be a that's going to be like another version of this like uh species explosion There'll be a lot of different technologies, a lot of different um, price points and services. Um, but until one of them really breaks the, the noise problem, you know, it's still going to have to operate like in the helicopter envelope uh, for, for a long time. There's just too much, too much kind of money and interest working against it. Um, you know, um, when uh, the one other thing I'll say about it is when um, uh, the um, what's the uh, the blueprints for autonomous urbanism? The um, the transit officials group um, published their sort of guidelines mm -hmm. uh, for how cities should should think about like street design. Um, you know, I, I said to them like, you need to put something in there about crash landing zones for for drones because they're not gonna like. They're gonna have like any, any license to operate a large number of drones in, in urban areas is gonna require, you know, a whole set of crash landing zones, and and some of them are gonna have to be in in the public right of way, um, and they their heads exploded. They just couldn't deal with that. And I said, you're 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 like trying to lay the guidelines for the street for the next forty or fifty years. Like you have to consider this. And they just refused to deal with it, um, which I, I found was, you know, yet another data point that like we weren't really ready to grapple, like with the consequences of a lot of things flying around. Yes, NACTO, that's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, NACTO's, NACTO's blueprints for autonomous urbanism say nothing about drones. Um, and the implication is that, you know, if cities are designed with those blueprints, drones will choose uh you know to crash land in the middle of your street <laughs> because they won't they won't crash on on the rooftops of buildings because that will subject them to lawsuits they will crash in the public right of way um yeah <laughs> kind of a crazy crazy thought to end on but... uh, do we have more questions Okay, I think, um, yeah, that's all the questions and comments. So thank you so very much, Dr. Townsend. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation and answering our questions. Thanks for the opportunity. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Sanchez, can you stay behind? Uh, sure. Thank you.